Hi, uh, my name is uh, Chevis Amin. I'm a professor here at the University of St. Thomas. Most people call me Dr. Amin. Um, and I, I actually did not start my career in the world of conservation, ecology, any of these kinds of things. I've actually found my life um, moving further and further towards that the older that I've gotten. And one of the things that I've learned is that there are a lot of great careers and jobs that are available in, a, in, in some very fulfilling areas, conservation, ecology, right? So um, well, the reason why I say they're fulfilling is that you get to do a lot of good work for the world, you get to do a lot of good work for the environment, and those things are, to certain people are, are really, really important. And I think that if that's really important to you, it's a really good idea to try to focus your career in that direction so that you can gain that kind of fulfillment that you're looking for. So today, we're gonna have a few different panel discussions that come in, and each one of these uh, panels are gonna be filled with individuals that have really interesting stories to tell about where they came from, how they got here, um, and, 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 cer and certainly they can give you advice no matter what field you wanna go into. If it's ecology, if it's conservation, they'll give you advice, but I guarantee you there's something that these three individuals that can teach you about any career path, wherever you wanna go. So, um, I want to have these individuals introduce themselves. Very good. So this is these these are their names and titles, but I thought it'd be great if we could start off by allowing them to introduce themselves and, and the types of jobs that they have. Hi, I'm Jaime Gonzalez from the Nature Conservancy in Texas, um, which is part of the, the, the Global uh, Nature Conservancy organization. I'm the Houston Urban Conservation Programs Manager um, for them, the first one. We established this program about 11 months ago to build a more resilient and healthy region for people and for wildlife. So I'm um, very happy to be here. I will also note that we're filming a lot of these session sessions today, so if you have friends or um, colleagues that want to see this later on, it will be on Facebook at some point here in the next week. Um, I'm Kelly Gonzalez. I'm with Crouch Environmental Services. Um, it's a consulting, environmental consulting company. Um, I'm a senior environmental scientist and a project manager. So uh, we do a lot of permitting, environmental surveys, um, wildlife work, you name it. Uh, I'm Ruth Ann Bagnell. I'm also a professor here at the university. Um, I have a PhD in marine ecology. I've worked in this area uh, in the Bay System, Galveston Bay System, Gulf of Mexico, done some work in the Bahamas. Um, so you can see I've had a really crappy life doing this. Um, but uh, I, I'm representing uh, sort of the, the academic side of, of uh, career in ecology. So each of you have a very different career. And I think the, the point of this first panel discussion is to try to help people understand things that will help jumpstart their career. So if each of you can tell us about a key moment in your lives that really jumpstarted your career and got you here, and, and give us maybe some advice about how we can uh, use that in our own lives. Any order? Uh, I got, actually, I got two moments. Um, so <clears throat> just real quickly, I um, worked at the Houston Arboretum Nature Center for seven years as a staff naturalist. As the first conservation lead, and then after that, I worked as a community conservation director for a local land trust called the Katy Perry Conservancy. Um, and the way I got my first gig at the Arboretum, I was working at a biotech company on the graveyard shift, like midnight to 8 a.m. It was really just horrendous. Um, and it wasn't what I wanted to do. I wanted to do wildlife stuff. Um, so I started volunteering at the Arboretum, volunteered there for maybe five or six months. And then a position came available to have uh, the first bilingual um, naturalist on staff. And so I fulfilled that role. And I had learned a lot about teaching because I knew nothing about teaching. Um, but that was really, as Cassidy said earlier in the hallway, that was really the key um, moment for me is being able to show value and also get networked. I think um, what I always tell people is, you know, if you're in the network, it's way easier to stay in the network than to get in the network, so get in the network and start showing people who you are. As my career progressed, one other key moment was um, I was quite happy at the Katy Perry Conservancy, uh, but then Hurricane Harvey hit, um, and then one month later, um, Hurricane Maria hit my, um, my parents' homeland in Puerto Rico. So it was very rough, and it brought home to me the, 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 the need to do something to make our world a more resilient place especially in light of climate change. And so um, I switched jobs. 
I changed jobs because of those two disasters and I changed the career focus and the career trajectory that I was on. So as you go through your career, this, this will happen to you too. You'll start thinking, I really want to be this, something will happen and then you might change focus. You might stay in the same career your whole life, but yeah, it'll, it'll, it's amazing how life will, will uh, offer you opportunities to redefine what you do. Um, I, I can attribute my career path. Um, there's a couple moments that really stand out for me. I think when I was in third grade, someone had told me uh, what you want to do in third grade is what you'll be the happiest doing. So I just kind of stuck. <laughs> I just ran with it. <laughs> so um, I loved animals in third grade. So I figured, hey, I'm going to be a veterinarian. Because at the time, that's all I thought I could do with loving animals. And so... Um, I went to school for to be a veterinarian, and I got to biochem two and realized mm, maybe I can maybe I should reconsider this. <laughs> so I actually um, did some part time weekend work with my ecology professor. He needed some people to help with his research, so I was like, mm, you know, like they're paying twelve dollars an hour. That's fantastic. I'm super broke. Let's just see what happens. <laughs> so um, with that opportunity, we were kayaking down Buffalo Bayou, looking at wildlife, um, smell, looking for smells, looking for any kind of things we could find. It was for a recreational uses attainability um, analysis. And I did that and I was just, I was sold. I was like, this is what I could do every single day. This is awesome. I wanna do this, um, great. So I did, <laughs> and so ever since then, I started doing the environmental aspect. I changed my major to wildlife and fisheries and it's been good ever since. Um, yeah, so I just that's probably what I just would suggest is to stay in contact with your professors, ask mm -hmm. if they need help. You know. uh, I think I had a, a, a very uh, sort of traditional career path in a way. I think some of the things that put me on the path that I stayed on, in a way I did kind of the same thing Kelly has done. Um, was, uh, according to my parents, uh, that I camped on Padre Island for the first time when I was six weeks old. And I, you know, growing up we went all the time. We camped, we did things. I was in love with the whole, the ocean, the beach, the everything about it. And when I was in ninth grade, uh, I did two projects in my biology class, two papers. Um, one was on the Portuguese Man of War, which I thought was the most fascinating thing I'd ever seen. <laughs> and, uh, and one was on fishes of the Gulf Coast. And I just, at that moment, I said, you know what? I'm gonna get a PhD in oceanography. Um, the opportunities for women then were pretty limited because I'm kind of old. And uh, so when I was that young, the, the opportunities were somewhat limited, but um, I at least said I'm going that route and um, I got very interested in invertebrates because I don't know why. I, I just always thought they were kind of cool. And the whole idea of seeing things that other people hadn't seen, you know, microscopic things, uh, it really fascinated me. And so I started working in invertebrates. I, I got a, a really good, uh, totally unexpected fellowship uh, for graduate school. And you know, it was like, boom, worked with plankton. Um, when I always felt very privileged to see creatures that were so amazing and so beautiful and so bizarre and to spend, as you said, all my days out on the bay in a little boat and tooling around, going out in the Gulf. And when I finished that, I, I did a postdoc working in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, studying plankton and also uh, scuba diving and collecting organisms off a uh, uh, rig supports in, uh, in an oil and gas field. And, you know, it's like, I, I, I'm never doing anything else. This is it for me. And there, I didn't even want to teach. You know, it's like, I just want to do that. <laughs> and I had a chance to teach a little bit in graduate school, and I thought, wow, how cool is this? I can tell people how cool this is. You know, they're going to have to listen to me. <laughs> and uh, you know, I just got really hooked on that. So I really believe that if you scratch an academic, I don't care what field they're in, you're going to find somebody with a really sort of evangelical zeal mm -hmm. for their field. 
and it's really intoxicating to get to study what you love, get to talk to people about it when they can't just walk away. Like if you're at a cocktail party and you start in on this, people are like, yeah, listen, I, I gotta take this call. <laughs> um, but you know, there's something about it, and when you feel that it's important, then it's even more spectacular. So I would say the same thing you guys have said. People know what they love, you feel it. I love all of biology, but there's something about ecology that it just captivates me, I gravitate toward it. And if you love it, eventually, I think you'll find, as, as Dr. Amin has said, that you've come to care very passionately about the environment, about the quality of the life we live, about what, what we're doing to or for the planet. And to have a chance to think that's important and then to go with it is important. So whatever you do, you know, if you, if you think you're interested in the academic side of things, talk to people, start thinking about graduate school way before it's time, start looking at who's doing what kind of work and how would you feel about it. I think that your, your comment about the network is really important. Some of us are not very outgoing uh, I talk a lot because I get paid to, but I'm really introverted, so it's much harder for me to, to do that, but do it. Do it anyway, because you're going to meet some amazing people, and you're going to have some amazing opportunities. And anything you can do, volunteering, go to some professor and say, hey, are you doing research? Is there anything I can do? I'll wash glassware, I'll you know, wash dirty nets, whatever, do it. It's, it's a beautiful life. Go for it. Those are some really insightful answers. I think each one of you gave some information that is really helpful, not only for people who are following like their ecological dreams, but rather just in professional avenues, no matter what it may be. First of all, I think what was really interesting from Jaime's story is how one of his first big breaks came because he uses bilinguality, mm -hmm. right? And so you might think he could have studied all of these different things in school, but it really jump-started him. His ability that you can speak two different languages. And you never know how there is a skill that you have that you may not think is applicable to the field that you want to do, but somehow jumpstarts your ability to do something really special in the world. I thought Kelly did a, a really wonderful job of describing how she hit a point in her life where she hit confusion. She didn't know what she wanted to do, but instead of caving inward, she looked outward for opportunities to experience something. So those experiences are super important, right? And through those experiences, you're gonna figure out what you actually want to do. You're not gonna you're not gonna have an epiphany sitting in your room by yourself. You gotta have those experiences. And I and I think Ruthann at, at the very end did a wonderful job of explaining how if you're gonna be happy in life, you're gonna follow your passion, right? So you, you you don't live other people's dreams. You live your own dream. And you figure out what you really care about. And it could be something very simple. It could be something like the beach, right? But if that's your passion, follow your passion. Because there are people that would sit up here that will tell you that they don't enjoy their job. Ruth Ann actually, her title is Professor Emeritus, which means that she was a professor here at the University of St. Thomas for a very long time. How many years, Ruth Ann? 38. 38 years. Than me. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for <laughs> thank you for pointing that out because <laughs> nobody would have guessed. Yeah. Rub it in, right? Yeah. That's okay. He's but, already on my list. <laughs> she retired, but she loves this work so much. She came out of retirement just to teach a few classes, right? You find me somebody who hated their life that will come out of retirement to go do something that they got, they used to get paid a lot more money to do. Oh yeah, so, <laughs> I used to get paid money actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so I think those are really good. Um, do you have any questions from the audience? These are much better when, when you guys follow your own curiosity and ask questions. So, so just when you're, when you're someone that's entry le level and you just earned your, just earned your back bachelor's, you're at a point in your li life trying to decide, Let's say you want to get your master's eventually, eventually. Hey, but it's, you also want to try and get your foot in the do door in the, in the field. Would it be better? Would it be better to try and get your door in the field now and get gain a little bit of experience first before pursuing your master's, or would or would you say it'd be, be better to pursue your master's, maybe taking internships during during the summers during that time you're getting your master's, or to 
or is it is it just not not so much of a black and white question question to ask there? I think it's not so much of a black and white question because um, so for my particular, I worked at the Arboretum for seven years, and the, I had a decision point um, whether to do wildlife science at A and M or to do um, environmental education. I had fallen in love with with teaching. Um, and I originally set out to go to A&M and then ended up at the University of Houston to do a master's degree in science education. Um, the experience that I gained by being at the Arboretum for seven years was real formative in telling me um, where I needed to go next. So sometimes I do see folks that go all the way through and then they're quite not sure where to go. So I don't think that there's a right or wrong answer to that question. I would say that one of the, the chief things that you should be doing is, you know, I agree with um, Dr. Amin that you should be following your passion, but sometimes p what people perceive as their passions don't fit well with their career. And this is what I mean by that. I don't think that we do a very good job in universities in teaching people about themselves. So um, I wanted to be a wildlife biologist, but then when I found out that would probably mean starting some internships and some things in some very remote places nobody around that wasn't me right I'm a very social person so I think taking personality tests strength finder tests get to know who you are so you can get to know where within that industry or within that field you will fit best from a personality standpoint because that's that's where I've seen there's been a little bit of a hink up is people think they want to do this it does not match up with their personality and then they think that that's not a good career path, but there's probably some other part of that, that sphere of work that you could do with your personality type. But you gotta match up your personality type with that career path. It's really, really critical. Yeah, I, I, you know, there are two things struck me. One is you're right. It's not a black and white um, situation. I was in grad school with people who did what I did, which is because I'm really single-minded and focused, you know, start at point A and go all the way to the end. Um, but I was also in grad school with people who were at, literally working at jobs and mm -hmm. then working on a master's degree. It's, it's harder to do that with a, with a PhD program. But so I think, you know, it, it kind of doesn't matter. It just matters that you, you keep moving yourself forward. Mm -hmm. What Jaime said about you don't always know what's a good fit for you until you try some things mm -hmm. is I was just lucky because what I did was a good fit right. for me because I was so you know blinders on but I have watched people do the same thing and and you have to be open to that you can't just say well this is what I'm gonna do right. I'm gonna do it you know and it, that's it um, but the other thing that's really important and I'm really bad at this and I, I have watched and admired people who are good at it is don't just take what exists as your only possibilities. Right. I have watched people create situations for themselves. I've watched people go in and talk to somebody and say, well, this is your program. It's kind of not totally right for me. What if we do this this way? What if I go mm -hmm. this direction a little bit more? I'm, I'm horrible at that. But people who, who really will do that, just take a little bit of a chance. What's the worst thing that can happen? Somebody's like, no. You know, my dad used to say a question unanswered, uh, unasked is a question answered no. And I, th I think that's true. So be fluid, give yourself a chance to discover who you are because you don't know it up front probably. Mm -hmm. And experiences are gonna happen to you. Be open to that fluidity, you know, kind of that go with the flow thing. But also imagine how you can uh, make a place for yourself that you like and I think that's, that's right. what you're saying that's I think exactly that's right. critical mm -hmm. um, my advice too is so when I got a undergrad I, I put myself through school so I have already had student loans going on so when I got out I of course wanted to go to graduate school but I just couldn't fathom the idea of taking out more loans I just didn't want to do it so I just went straight to work and I tried, I went to work working super hard. I wanted to learn everything I could. My first job I was working on uh, the Houston Ship Channel working for the Port of Houston. So I was doing environmental inspections on dredging operations and um, a lot of work with creating beneficial uses sites. Um, I had told my boss, look, this is what I'm really passionate about. I really love wetlands, I love marshes, I love birds. Um, what can I do to help? 
And so I would just go and take notes for the meetings. Um, I would, and so that enabled me to meet U.S. Fish and Wildlife, Texas Parks and Wildlife, NOAA, make some really strong connections. Um, after I was working there, I had the opportunity to go to graduate school, but I was still in student loan debt. <laughs> so um, I had this rare opportunity where I could either go to graduate school and get my degree, and um, I got accepted into Texas A&M and Galveston for marine biology. And the day I found out about that opportunity is another day that I got in a volunteer opportunity in South Africa doing rehabilitation yeah. work. So I was just like, crap. What do I do? <laughs> um, world, travel the world, experience things, or go into more student loan debt. So I went to South Africa. <laughs> um, after South Africa, I got back and I started, went straight back to work. I was super excited to be making more money again. And um, I had another opportunity where I was like, okay, if I apply to graduate school, I'm going in full, full speed ahead. Like I'm not gonna t tell them no again. Like I don't wanna waste their time. I don't wanna waste my time. So um, I thought about applying, but then a headhunter found me and gave me the position, like kind of put me in the position that I am now, and I was like, well, do I need to go to grad school now? So um, I would constantly battle with myself of going back for graduate school, because um, I, I think it's a really valuable experience, and the people that we have that have their grad degree, they're fantastic, they're awesome, but um, I think it's also about what you feel the most comfortable with. You know, um, life kind of throws you challenges and hurdles, but um, you just gotta keep going with it. That's right. so. Also, also her attempt, her graduate here as well. Okay. Or, or what was that? Oh, I thought you said you graduated from Texas A&M oh, University yeah. of Galveston. I was just saying I, I also graduated there too. Oh, nice. Yeah, I went. So I, my undergrad was at in College Station, but I had gotten accepted into the Galveston program. But they're a great program. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, yeah. Sorry. Oh yeah. So, just to recap. You so you still haven't taken that graduate stu graduate school decision. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have a master's in in curriculum instruction in science education with a focus on environmental education. Right. Cool. It's mm -hmm. it's science education. <laughs> <laughs> but that was very instrumental in getting you launched, didn't it? Right. That's right. So I I'm one of these people, and I think uh, Ruth Ann is absolutely right. You know, a job description is a starting point. You know, for those of us who like to warp that job description wherever we go and make it our own, because we have certain competencies that each of us possess, and it's rare that someone will prefigure all your competencies <laughs> on a job description. Yeah. So you have to make it your own, right? And I've always been someone that didn't want to pick between ecology and wildlife science and human health and sustainability or teaching. So I, haven't, I, I refuse to make that choice. Um, and so in my current job at TNC, um, we're doing science, we're doing education, we're doing sustainability, we're doing all of it intersected, race, environment, the whole thing intersected. It's very complicated, very rich, deep work. Um, so one thing I would suggest is that, um, and we don't tell this story enough, and I think Ruth Ann who's a, and, and, and other teachers in here in the room will, will uh, recognize this, Every single one of you is a teacher. You do not have a choice because you're a human being. The only choice you have is how good of a teacher you are. You don't have a choice as to whether you're a teacher, even if you don't open your mouth, you're teaching people. So be a good teacher, be a good storyteller, because even if you are the scientific type and you're an introvert, the way you get funding is by telling good stories. Because other human beings and not computers are reading your grant proposal. So be a good storyteller because it is the thing that has helped propel my work, even though oftentimes it's science-based, the ability to storytell and communicate. So I went on and got a, um, a graduate certificate in environmental communications from Duke because I want to continue to get more discerning about how to communicate out my ideas and to move the needle with folks, decision makers, communities, and things like that. So even if you have, you're not a teacher, uh, by training, improve as much as you can both your writing and your presentation skills because it's the thing that has made Jane Goodall Jane Goodall. That's right. If she didn't ever speak out, you'd never know who she was, and those chimps would not have the help that they need. So be a good storyteller if you can. There are lots of ways to practice that or get training. 
I, I would like to throw something real quick. I thought Kelly's story right there about continually assessing whether or not she mm -hmm. wanted to get a graduate degree. Mm -hmm. I think that's how you should all view a graduate degree, right? Especially if there's money attached to going to the process. If you're going to go for a master's, it means you're going to invest money into the situation. You need to make sure that you're doing a good calculation of whether or not that master's is going to bring you something new that's going to change your earning potential or your career trajectory. And Kelly pointed out, she had the job that she wanted. This is the point of going and getting a master's right. just to collect letters, right? I think well, the experience and functioning is what's most important. And if you can do what you want to do, and you can do it well, then the other stuff is an exercise. Mm -hmm. You know, do you have the luxury of doing that? Is that how you want to spend your time? Because it's just an exercise. You know, if it doesn't, if it doesn't enhance your life, if it doesn't enhance the way you work, if it doesn't enrich your community for you to do that, you know, it's. I think I think Kelly obviously made really good choices. <laughs> really good choices. And it, it involved a lot of really hard work, like you know, doing the extra effort after I got done with all the job, reading the books, seeking mm -hmm. out books that professors had assigned when I was an undergrad that I just feel like I didn't have the time to read. Mm -hmm. And then right. even talking to my friends who went to graduate school, hey, what, what books are you reading? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, just seeking out that information to make yourself yourself that much more valuable um, for whatever task it is that you get assigned to do. And it's another way of doing what Jaime said and what I was saying I'm bad at, which is creating your own niche, creating right. your own space and making sure that you you fill that space, you know, as beautifully as you can. So yeah, and I think that's exactly what you've done, which is really admirable. Well and one thing that I would I would add to that, because it is a very good point, is you guys don't need to go back and get up team degrees, I mean, you have an opportunity to do things that we didn't. Um, there are many, many, think about what competencies you need. There's probably an online program that can help you get those skills. So within the Nature Conservancy, we're lucky because we have basically an online university because we have 4,000 people, right? So I can take classes in GIS or project management or any of this stuff. But let's say you're an early career person and you're, or a mid-career person, and there's edX, there's Coursera, there's, you know, so I've taken, classes from really great professors at Cornell and Duke and Columbia and all these people I'd never get a chance to go study with because I'm working because I have selected these are the skills that I need how can I get those skills and you get certificates and training that way and I think that's really the way that professions are going to move in the future is short duration either semester long or year long certificates or something to bump up your skill set so um, many of those courses are really good you get to interact with the best minds in the field without leaving home. I was first gen, uh, put myself through school, both levels, and so I can't, I can't afford to go get a PhD. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and use what is available to me, either at reduced cost or, or pretty cheap to, to get that, that filled. Which is the other huge thing. And I don't care what field you're in, yep. I don't care what kind of work you do, I don't care if you sit at home and twiddle your thumbs. <laughs> The important thing in life is you keep educating right. yourself. You keep growing. You keep asking, what can I be that's mm -hmm. better than I am? Where can I go that puts me in a better place? What can I do to better serve my community? It's it's lifelong, mm -hmm. and that's a perfect example yeah. of it. it. Yeah, it takes some effort. Like, you were working full time, mm -hmm. and you feel like after you've been working all day, coming home and working some more, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, it's hard. Yeah. Just just wanted to ask on those certi certificates is, is do you have any tips on them when looking looking for some of these online certificates to make sure that I, you know they're legitimate and not just and not just scams because just with my own personal experience I tried I tried to look for a 40 hour OSHA OSHA have saw her online club online class at hens I found I found a few of them were scam or scams mm. and they will they're all my hand like their online tests wouldn't even work. Mm -hmm. so, sorry. I don't know if that's I don't do regulatory stuff, so that's a whole different world. Yeah. Um, but I would I mean I take, you know, classes from from people I can go and look at the professor. <laughs> this is the professor, mm -hmm. this is the body they work, this is their C V. So I can kind of gauge if they are an ex expert in their field. But as far as regulatory classes, I don't know if you have anything to add for that. Um, for regulatory, I mean, 
I think if you go to the OSHA website or like the establishment agency, they'll have recommendations. Uh -huh. And so if you want to get those certificates, just make sure you use, you know, authorized websites to go uh -huh. through that. And even if, like, so I do the Coursera too, and I absolutely love it, but sometimes I don't want to pay the $40. <laughs> so I don't, I'm like, well, I still learn it. <laughs> you know, so it's up to you guys um, what works the best. Yeah, and it's, I, I also think it's really good to be passionate about, well, you know, we kind of touched on it when we first started talking about it, but even, there was weeks I was working 100-hour weeks, and I would still come home and pull open a book and like, oh, let's learn, read about jellyfish. There's one that just came out not long ago, but anyways. And um, when you really love your job, it doesn't feel like work. And sometimes for me, it's hard for me to just stop. Like, I just want to keep going and going and going. Like, I'll do it because I get so excited about everything. So um, make sure that you really, really enjoy the work. Because if you do, um, work won't feel like work. It'll just be fun every single day. I'm teaching one course right now. I'm up here five days a week all day and getting home at 6.30 or 7 or something like that because it's just too much fun. We are out of time for this panel, so can we give a round of applause for the panel? <laughs> we're going to take a 15-minute break, and we're going to recharge with three new panelists, and um, we're going to focus.